Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Um, we're going live this Wednesday and uh, I am your host or <laughs> your uh, speaker for this breakout session titled Mental Health. Um, but I gave it my own little twist and I ca I'm calling this The Quiet Before the Storm. Um, I'll be in Luke chapter 22 uh, reading from 39 through 46. Uh, but I want to start off with the meme um, from this year, 2020. And I don't really uh, follow memes. I I'm not really big with uh, social media even, really. Uh, but I was strolling to uh, someone I know, uh, their story, and I, I came upon this meme that I thought was hilarious and I think uh, really <laughs> was... Uh, impactful during this time and uh, I, I, I really don't remember I didn't copy it but it went something like does the year 2020 have a half time uh, and uh, maybe I'm killing it but what I what I thought was so hilarious is that uh, this year just came back to back to back to back with so many different uh, events and you know you know, big, <laughs> big surprises. And um, we didn't even get a break. We didn't even get a chance to kind of like uh, relax and enjoy the 2020 year. You know, we just got hit with all these things. And, and now we're in July, you know, and, you know, you never know. We might get more surprises, uh, which is uh, why I'm bringing up this uh, conversation here. Um, uh, I just want to go over some significant events that happened this year. Uh, I'll probably start from, from when I can remember what happened first. Uh, there was the passing of Kobe Bryant, the you know, famous and popular and icon uh, Kobe Bryant, who played for the Los Angeles Lakers. Um, you know, that was a big, big, big loss for uh, our country, I think. Uh, California definitely and then even uh, the world you know it was felt around the world really um, this this man you know you know play the game uh, won championships uh, was super super competitive um, and uh, beyond that he just wanted to do so many other things uh, uh, there was also the passing of his daughter and those other individuals in that uh, helicopter crash. So again, that was, that was, I think, a big hit. And that was just really at the turn of the year, um, at the beginning of the year, sorry. Um, then there was uh, claims of impeachment uh, for our president. I know that was big, you know, <laughs> there was big stories going along about how they wanted to get our president out of office. Um, then COVID hit, COVID-19, what we know as a coronavirus. Um, and that was, uh, I mean, that had already been known and talked about in uh, 2019, but it wasn't really that big here in the States, at least not till March uh, when schools got shut down and we were placed under stay-at-home orders, and which we are still in. Um, there was the, like I said, the shutdown of schools and businesses. Uh, then during that time period, there was evidence of racism where we saw different uh, moments, different um, uh, occasions where uh, what looked like racism was being um, shown. And um, that was happening, uh, you know, around, the, uh, around our country too. Um, then there was the police brutality uh, where, um, you know, an officer, uh, I think what we all saw uh, was pretty evident. Um, then there was the countrywide protests uh, that followed those two uh, events. And, and those were happening around the country and even in some parts of the world. And I think... Uh, that was a pretty big uh, event there. Um, and, and there were so many more. And again, like I said, we're just in July, so you never know what new surprises will come upon. Um, what does this all mean, though, with all these different events taking place, specifically in this year? 
Um, it means that the world is rapidly changing around us and it's filled with chaos and uncertainty. Uh, but God, um, and I want you to keep that in mind when uh, the next uh, surprising event happens, uh, either in, you know, in, that impacts our country or just impacts your life, but God. You know, that event might bring surprises, that event might bring chaos, that event might bring you uncertainty, but God. Always remember that, but God. Uh, this assignment is not about mental health necessarily because I felt like that subject was too, uh, it was too big and um, also I felt like uh, there needed to be an actual professional that knows about it, that studies it, that, that to talk about it. But I took a little twist on it um, and, I, and, I, and I'm using what us as believers, how we can prepare our minds, our hearts, and our souls to, in, to endure in times of trouble, similar to the season we're in. And more than that, this is a speech to hopefully feed your mind and thoughts with healthy knowledge and philosophy, uh, a way of thinking. And so that's my version of mental health. Uh, keeping your mind healthily thinking about God's truth. Um, so I have two questions. Uh, how do we prepare for the rest of 2020 and 2021? Is there any hope for the future? Or is the darkness sure to extinguish the light? I think these are two big questions that we as believers have and a lot of the world has, I think. And, you know, they, you know, different people may run to different things and may search for answers in different things. And that's fine. But that doesn't take away the same question that we all have. Um, what is going to happen? Is there any hope? And what seems like evil what seems like death, is it going to extinguish the light that is in us or that is, or, or any good that is in this world? I want to read, uh, like I said, a portion of the book of Luke in the 22nd chapter and then glean some thoughts uh, to possibly answer my two questions and other questions that I may have. I'll start off uh, on the 39th verse. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet, not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? he asked them. Get up and pray so that you may will not fall into temptation. Um, and then in case you're not familiar, what happened, uh, you know, to end the, chat, uh, to end the, the book of Luke, uh, after this event, Jesus is taken to be judged by religious leaders, uh, by uh, Pilate, and then Herod. Uh, he is then beaten, tortured, and crucified and buried. But he rises on the third day according to Jewish time and appears to his believers on several occasions like the tomb, the road to Emos, and back in Jerusalem. Finally, he blesses them before he ascends to heaven. Um, before life hits us with surprises, 
what can we do to be ready? And, and let's see uh, some examples that Jesus can give us to help us. Number one, I think is important, is have a daily routine of communion with God, a.k.a. pray. It's called a spiritual life. Um, I think we all have our personal life that we may have, but as believers, we need to know and understand that we also have a spiritual life. And that can only be uh, uh, grown by our prayer life and our walk with God. This is not an inner soul quest or a search for one's own higher self, uh, like some of the philosophies and some of the uh, religions out there, that if you're looking for the best of yourself, you need to just look for it and find it in yourself. Um, this is Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That is our spiritual life where we are in Christ. He is protecting us and we are meditating on his truth. Uh, not anxious about anything. We are prayerful, guarded by Christ, thinking about truth. It's not like storms will not come. It's not that we, uh, that we won't know when storm will come. It's not that we won't be affected by these storms. Rather, I've protected my mind and heart from being anxious about anything by being prayerful and meditating on His truth. An example is um, I'm reminded of my wife, Alexia. Um, you know, if she ever needs to make a decision or a choice, uh, she won't move ahead with it. Uh, until she's heard from the Lord. Um, she takes her time and she really seeks to hear from Him and what He has to, to say about her decision making. Um, at first, this communication or stillness uh, brought me frustration and I did not believe what she was actually doing was hearing from God. Uh, I didn't really think that she had that... Um, that, um, that gift to, to hear him, uh, you know, uh, I always thought it was audible. You know, you can't hear from God. There's no way you can hear from God. Um, I thought it was just procrastination, really. Um, yet, I couldn't argue with the results and her diligence. I mean, it seemed like every single time that she was faithful to what he said, waited for what he had to say, you know, it was always to our blessing. Even me, who didn't believe, I was still blessed uh, by her faithfulness and her diligence. It wasn't like she just did it once and then she did it the next month or the next year for another big event. It was every single day. If she needed to make, uh, you know, an important decision or important choice for her, she was always seeking God. Um, for example, um, I used to coach at Moreno Valley High School, uh, the girls' varsity team, and we had an away game at a high school uh, nearby uh, by San Bernardino. And um, uh, during this time, I, I, I would take off my ring um, because I would put sunblock on. But that was very important that I would take off my ring for, for things like putting on lotion or sunblock. And she would always say, don't do it. Don't do it because, you know, you never know. You might lose it. And so in this 
occasion. Uh, before the game, I was putting on some block and I took off my ring. And, you know, I went through the game and, you know, went home. And it wasn't until I, re I, I, I think I saw her and I was with her that I realized I didn't have my ring. And I couldn't remember where I had put my ring. And the only thing I could remember was um, being at the game and putting on sunblock. And whenever I put sunblock on, uh, I would take off my ring. And, and so she was like, well, we got to go back and look for it. We got to go find it. So we drove. Uh, back to the high school, and unfortunately, it was locked. It was a rainy day too, so uh, you know there was the uh, maybe the the idea of hopping over a fence and you know looking for it, but we just thought that was just too much. And, and in that moment, we're outside, rain's pouring. We got to make a decision whether we hop the fence and look for it or just go back home. You know, she was seeking God and she was asking where's the ring number one and will we find it and she just kept hearing getting back that it's okay the ring is there and you can get it when the school reopens um and you know again i was like okay sure um you know you know i was already i think thinking about what to do in case the ring wasn't there um so long story short uh we go uh when the school reopened early in the morning, and so we had to get up uh, really early. Uh, we go, we rush down to the uh, stadium. Uh, luckily, it was near the parking lot and the gates were open. And uh, we started looking around, and I'm sure people around were saying, who are these you know, individuals walking on our field? Uh, and you know, I, I just went around the path that I uh, was walking, and sure enough, underneath, the bench where uh, we had just, where our team and I had sat for our game was my ring. And, uh, you know, that, that I want to say that moment, that event really changed my perspective as far as believing her and believing that she can hear from God and trusting her um, and trusting her patience too to find out what God has to say about, uh, you know, what we care for. Uh, she finally won me over and I really trusted she was receiving clarification from the Almighty Himself. Uh, my wife was not content with a mediocre line of communication. She knew she had a direct line and she wanted to squeeze every drop of wisdom available to her. And that is so true is that we have to you know, Jesus is our advocate and he is praying our behalf and he sacrificed his life to reconcile us to God so that way we can come to God with our petitions and we cannot underestimate that uh, sacrifice and we can't just, you know, you know, put it in a box and say, okay, prayer is only for in the morning or at night. It really should be a constant uh, theme throughout our day as far as, you know, making decisions. And, you know, uh, I know then the question begs, uh, well, should we ask uh, God's help or assistance for small decisions like what to eat, um, what should I wear? And, and, you know, you may get the idea, oh, well, no, I don't have to do that. Um, if it's in your heart to do so, then you should definitely do it. Because, I mean, if you're asking for wisdom, for guidance on what to eat, and you know you feel in yourself that you need to eat healthier, you want to make better choices with your, with your food, then, of course, ask him, what does he have for you? you know, what can he suggest to you for you to eat that will be healthy and nourishing for you and your mind? Um, and so do that. And, and as far as what you wear, of course, if you know that you need to lean more towards being um, just uh, displaying uh, just God's holiness, uh, uh, then you should do that. You should ask Him uh, how to, uh, you know, guard your, your body in, in a certain way and how to not uh, just mislead individuals. What I'm trying to say is God alerts her to different things depending on the situation and she's able to then know what to ask for. 
This will not be possible without a bond of communication and trust. And like I said, if we have a time of prayer with God and we're daily speaking with God, then a bond will automatically be built and it will be strengthened. And that bond can only be uh, active and alive and vibrant by communication and trust. Uh, some self-reflection. What is your communication like line with God like? How close is your walk with God like? It's as simple as a choice and a decision. It really is. Um, make the choice that you will seek God every morning, every night. Make the decision to seek Him first before making an important decision or any type of decision that will impact your life. You choose to pause the fast-paced life you're caught in to see your relationships, your duties, your calling, and decisions from God's eyes, from God's perspective. When we forgo spending time alone with God, our thoughts about Him are, are influenced by what the world says. And these are just some terrible examples of what the world has to say about God. Uh, God doesn't know what's going on in my life or the world. God is in his, his own world and we are left to our own devices. God is not in control. God doesn't care about my life or the world. Uh, the funny thing is that um, Cleopas, a believer of Christ, in chapter 24 of Luke, ask a similar question that the world probably uh, has, has asked more than once. He asked, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Um, so these two believers are walking to uh, Emos, and along the road, they're talking about all that has happened, Jesus' life and, you know, his teachings and him being sacrificed, crucified, and, and then rising up, you know, from what they believe they heard from the reports that he had risen or he was not at his tomb. And, and you know, they're encountered by Jesus who meets them on this road. And, and uh, again, he doesn't let himself be revealed to them. And he just asks them, uh, what are you guys talking about? And they're like, do you not know what, are you the only person that doesn't know what's been going on? Like, where have you been? And it's so funny that they're asking uh, Jesus himself <laughs> if he knows what's going on. If he, has he been paying attention? Is he oblivious to what's been going on? Uh, I think our Savior uh, either has a sense of humor or he's just a great conversationalist because he knows how to start conversations because he knows how to get stuff out of individuals by just talking to them. Of course, Jesus knew what had happened. It was a fulfilled prophecy from, you know, scripture that this was going to happen. Uh, moreover, uh, Jesus takes over the conversation of these two believers and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. So he takes over the conversation and, and basically from the beginning of their trip to where they were heading, which I think was uh, a long distance. And I mean by long, I'm talking about long, uh, which what would have took maybe seven hours in a car ride uh, took them, uh, I'm not sure how long, but it was a long walk. And during that walk, he goes through everything, really, basically from Moses, through the prophets, all the way to back to his life, what had happened. That's a long, those are long, 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 uh, you know, uh, subjects and content that he's going over, basically just ex describing everything that God had planned, had established, had said was going to happen, and how it led to happen for a purpose. 
Uh, Jesus leaves his throne. Think about this. Jesus leaves his throne to descend onto us. He accomplishes his will through every obstacle so that the world, the world would not perish but have eternal life. So the answer to all the you know, terrible examples of where is God, he doesn't care, he's not in control, it doesn't matter. Really, is God will accomplish his will and it all has a purpose and is basically to redeem the world. So he does care and he is in control because he's planned it from the get-go. Um, number two, things we can pray for. Temptation prevention, removal of pain and suffering, strength to endure pain and suffering, and peace in pain and suffering. These are things that we can pray for. The theologian Matthew Henry suggests Jesus was advising disciples to pray against temptation because they would see their Lord arrested, beaten, and crucified. As a result, they might fall into believing everything Jesus had said about himself was all a lie. That he wasn't the Son of God, the Messiah. That was the temptation that he wanted them to pray for. That they would not, you know, be uh, influenced by the world and what, they were, and what they were seeing even. Because they had to trust his word what he had already spoken to them. Uh, and I agree with this opinion from uh, Matthew Henry because I've witnessed believers lose their faith after experiencing trials. There's a book called Sea of Faith by a uh, very you know, educated, intelligent, well-known professor at Cambridge. Um, and, and he left his faith after the storms of life he experienced, had taken all his faith in God. And that began a movement now that still exists, um, whereby, you know, they believe that uh, religion is good, religion exists, uh, but obviously without the need of God. And uh, I know of someone who became angry with God after their father was arrested and deported. And so they saw this event as his arrest and deportation as something like, God, why? Why did you allow this? You know, uh, you know I needed him. Or, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, now what am I going to do? Um, but they don't see the whole picture. Um, I know the individual really well. And um, I can tell you, that, yes, the, the father was arrested, the father was deported, but the father actually ended up being deported back to his country of his birth, and he is now with his family members and loved ones that he has not seen in over 10 plus years. And um, there would be no other way for him to, be, to see them or be around them uh, especially if he stayed in this country because as an illegal, he could not obviously cross back and forth. And so, yes, this, um, you know, th this was a loss for the son, but I think it was still God's love and, and God's grace for the son and the father too, to where, you know, he didn't send him to be in a cell uh, but rather, you know, he's out in the free and he's out with loved ones. And so, um, regardless if the son thinks that's not the best, uh, you know, situation or whatever, it's still God's grace and still God's love. And we got to see it from that perspective. Um, I'm reminded, though, of Luke 6, 48. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, 
The torrent struck that house, but could not shake it because it was well built. See, conversely, uh, my mother was abandoned with her siblings and she never lost faith in God that he would bring her out of that mire. Um, you know, she was only, I believe, seven or eight years old. She would always tell me the story when I would, you know, rebel and, and, and uh, get in trouble in school. She would sit me down. She would tell me basically what Jesus told these two believers. She would recount from her childhood what God had done and how big uh, he was in her life. And so she, she was abandoned um, at like seven or eight with uh, a few of her siblings. Um, and, and, you know, she was the eldest, so she had to look after these individuals, and her siblings. And, um, you know, I just can't imagine. Uh, I mean, we're talking about... Um, uh, it was uh, Mexico in this time, and we're talking about, you know, back in the day when no internet, electricity, maybe in that part of uh, where she was at was not great. Water was probably not, uh, you know, accessible like that, you know, and food and things like that. Um, and she, she, you know, just trusted God, and I, and I don't even... I, I haven't really asked her what, um, uh, how did she know about God at that young age? Who taught her uh, or told her about God at that young age? But regardless, she just trusted him, kept faith in him after trial, after trial, after trial, after trial, until uh, where she stands now. I know a faithful um, uh, believer, a uh, member of MCA. Um, uh, another example is the apologist, Ravi Zacharias, uh, came to faith in God after lying on a hospital bed after attempting suicide. Um, another one is my wife and I. We never doubted, doubted God's sovereignty after going through a miscarriage. Um, uh, you see, I think uh, obviously our faith was, was rooted in God. You know, our foundation was Him. And so even though this hard uh, event uh, that crushed us really happened, it, you know, we never doubted that he was still good and that he still had a plan and, you know, that one day he would, you know, have us to be parents. And uh, thankfully we are. And, um, and we're so thankful that we always trusted him, that we were rooted in him. Um, we don't have... The full picture, like I said, it's really only a pixel. See, a picture is, is a huge, huge thing. And it just, uh, pixels are the little tiny uh, things that make up the whole picture. And there's uh, millions of them, billions of them in just one picture. And so that's what we have, just a little small glimpse, a very, 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 very tiny, tiny glimpse of the whole big picture and God sees everything and you know what we see as you know something difficult hard um, crazy happening to us and we wonder oh, you know what is God's plan in all of this we have to trust him because he has the whole picture and we cannot just rely on what we see what we you know what we are only knowing at that time uh, God is the only one who sees everything that is and will be. He knows the purposes of moments and everything is in his control. It is said he does not conquer in spite of evil, but through it. That, you know, even though the enemy had used uh, the religious leaders and other individuals to... Uh, beat to ridicule Jesus and to crucify him and the enemy thought oh you know I, I'm, I'm gonna get I'm gonna stop God's plan of saving the world you know he it's not that Jesus uh, you know had to overcome those obstacles is that he used that he used all of that and, and we see that now in our lives is that we can relate to this personal 
God who has gone through difficult things, who's gone through pain and suffering, who knows what it's like to suffer and to have pain, to know what it's like to be ridiculed. And we can relate to him and he can relate to us. And so he uses all of that for his goal. When the enemy thought he was killing the hope of the world by crucifying Christ, he was actually raising the Lord to the right hand of the Father. You know, and so again, what the enemy thought he was going to, you know, achieve was actually he was achieving God's plan instead of his own. So who is God? And this is taken from the catechism that our church did in 2019. Uh, I think this is question number three, um, or it's number two, I think. Uh, the creator and sustainer of everyone and everything. He is eternal, infinite, and unchangeable in his power and perfection, goodness and glory, wisdom, justice, and truth. Nothing happens except through him or his will. Nothing happens except through him or his will. Wow. I believe the best tactic we can do as believers for the remainder of this year and the next is pray. But pray consistently. Pray with purpose and peace of mind that he is listening and in control. And pray earnestly. Although our hope keeps getting attacked by new and different events, receive the peace of God and know that His plan will succeed through the darkness. And I just want to leave you with one last scripture and, uh, and then finally uh, pray. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John chapter 1, verse 2, 5. Father God, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to um, just share some thoughts that I pray are from you. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, anything useful, anything uh, truthful uh, that is from you, that these uh, young individuals can take and use for their life, Lord. I thank you that, uh, you know, you showed us a great example uh, of what it's like to uh, build a life of prayer, a spiritual life. Um, we thank you that uh, you can relate to us and we can relate to you. Um, you know, we all share pain and suffering. Um, but, but beyond that, Lord, you have overcome it all. And it's so thankful that you are our Lord and Savior and that we can uh, trust you, lean on you, uh, with all of our cares and needs and worries. And Lord, you make, it, uh, you, made it, you make it available for us to pray to remove this pain or the suffering. Uh, you give, we pray for your strength to endure difficult situations. And, and we pray for a temptation as well to uh, be strong in those moments, Lord. Um, Lord, I pray that you would bless the remainder of their day. I pray that you would bless this church and you would bless the team uh, as their faithfulness to you and uh, devotion to want to help the youth and, and just share uh, just things of God, Lord, truth. And um, I'm so thankful that you use us, Lord. Uh, you know, and uh, I thank you that uh, I cannot rely on my own strength and my own um, intelligence, but I, I trust in you, Lord. Uh, and so I just, I thank you, and I pray for 
uh, these individuals, that you would uh, raise them up to be men and women of God. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.